Chuck Baldwin ran in 2008 as the Constitution Party's presidential candidate. He's also a writer and radio talk show host. Chuck breaks down the left-right paradigm and how the globalists are in control of both major political parties. He talks about solutions and actions the American people can take to reverse the New World Order's criminal agenda and restore our republic. I'm Chuck Baldwin. I'm a syndicated columnist, radio talk show host, and for 35 years, the pastor of Crossroad Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. I'm the husband of one, the father of three, and the grandfather of seven. I've said all over the country that I believe that we have far more to fear from Washington, D.C. than we do from Tehran or from uh, Afghanistan or some other foreign entity. Uh, the Founding Fathers recognized that, and I think that we need to start recognizing it again today. Uh, the potential for tyranny, usurpation of power, etc., is far greater from the central government in D.C. than it is from any foreign entity. My main reason for running in 2008 was because Dr. Ron Paul was defeated in the Republican primary. I was uh, supporting him uh, during that primary. In fact, I traveled to several states endorsing his candidacy. Uh, I believe his message of constitutional government is exactly the message that America needed and still needs. When it became obvious that he would not be the Republican nominee, uh, several people, including those within the Constitution Party, urged me to consider becoming their candidate in 2008 so that the message of constitutional government could continue throughout the general election process. Obviously, a lot of prayer and thought went into that, but at the end of the day, I accepted that challenge, and the Constitution Party uh, committee and, and, and the membership of that organization chose me to be their nominee in 2008 for president. And so I traveled throughout the, the 50 states uh, doing the same thing that Ron Paul was doing, and that is speaking the message of constitutional government. Uh, we'd like to address some of the FEMA and national emergency issues uh, during our interview today. And one of those items that's come up over the past few years are the clergy response teams. We've had leaked information about pastors being used uh, for those purposes. Uh, could you tell us what you know about that? And yeah, concerns you? I've heard the same thing. In fact, I had a pastor friend of mine from Ohio that told me that he was solicited uh, by uh, FEMA representatives for that purpose. And he actually attended one of the training seminars. And he and I had a lengthy discussion over the telephone as he relayed to me, uh, you know, the information that was, uh, that was given out and, and, and what they were trying to do. There's no question that, it, that there was a concerted effort, and probably still is, uh, to enlist pastors and clergymen to be part of uh, some kind of, as you said, a clergy response team. And the primary goal of that would be to use the, the clergymen uh, to encourage their constituents, their parishioners, etc., to submit to whatever governmental decree would come down in the event of a national emergency, including uh, the confiscation of firearms. And, of course, that's something that I would never do. In fact, I, when I found out about it, I told my church here in Pensacola uh, that not only would I never encourage them to give up their firearms, I would instead encourage them to go buy, buy one if they didn't have one and buy more if they already had one. So obviously uh, I have not received a personal invitation to one of these seminars, but I certainly have understood and, and, and believe that they do exist and are continuing. Uh, we know that since National Security Act was passed back in 1947, <clears throat> We've had black budgets and unaccountable CIA and other activity. And earlier this year, the Washington Post reported that in top secret USA, we now have more than 800,000 people working under national security clearance, uh, basically totally untrackable. Could you speak to that and uh, how we should address accountability in government? Yeah, I wrote a column on that, as a matter of fact. Um, and I think my good friend, Joel Skousen, uh, over in Utah has done some, some really great research into that as well. It, it, it's really unbelievable that this kind of dark uh, operation would be taking place behind the scenes. We have many good federal agents in every, uh, every level uh, of government, uh, in every agency, that have no idea whatsoever that these dark operations are going on behind the scenes and out of view. 
many times uh, illegally, unlawfully, unconstitutionally, and almost always surreptitiously. Uh, so, you know, I, and I've talked to uh, federal agents myself who have indicated of some of the things that they've seen and are very concerned about. Uh, there's no question that these rogue elements uh, are uh, in existence uh, behind the scenes within our federal government. You know, I think the Founding Fathers tried to avert this kind of a thing as best they could by the way they established this form of government. For example, we have three equal branches of government within the federal government. Each one's designed to be a check and balance against the other. Obviously, for the last several decades, that check and balance has not worked. Uh, beyond that, they incorporated into the Bill of Rights the Second Amendment, which gives the right of the people to defend themselves against tyrannical government. And the Second Amendment was never about duck hunting or target shooting. It was always about the right of the people to defend themselves against tyrannical government uh, within their own country. Uh, but then they also, I think, very brilliantly incorporated something that's never really been tried before in the annals of human government, and that is the principle of federalism which means you have two existing authorities and jurisdictions uh, operating side by side. You have the federal central government and you have state government. Each has its own sphere of authority and jurisdiction. And because of that, uh, we have uh, states, uh, especially certain states, that see what's happening many times in the usurpation of constitutional jurisdiction, and they're beginning to rise up. Uh, we, we've got the Montana Firearms Freedom Act and the Tennessee Firearms Freedom Act. We've got Arizona fighting the federal government over illegal immigration. Uh, there are some 20 states that are in lawsuit right now against the federal government over the Obamacare plan, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I really believe that the future hope for America in terms of freedom and liberty is going to be uh, in those states that are willing to stand for their own authority and jurisdiction as prescribed by the Constitution. The, the Anti-Federalists uh, obviously were uh, not in favor of the, the newly proposed Constitution at all. And they, they felt that it was actually worse than the Articles of Confederation, which it replaced. And without the implementation of the Bill of Rights, the first ten articles, uh, there's no question that the Constitution would not have passed in the state legislatures. And there would not be a Constitution as we know it today. The, the, the Bill of Rights was absolutely critical, essential to the uh, adoption of the Constitution. Uh, and, and the states obviously did not, at that point in time in 1787, uh, give up their own personal sovereignty. And that, that's the thing that so many people have forgotten is, you know, the states created the federal government, not the other way around. And after the federal government was created in 1787 by the, the enactment of the Constitution, the states still retained all of their jurisdiction and authority. And as Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration, the states are free and independent. They were before the Constitution was ratified and they were after the Constitution was ratified. And uh, so I think that, once again, the states' rights movement uh, is going to be the, the, the surest way for freedom-loving citizens in 21st century America to regain uh, the liberties that have been uh, usurped by the federal government in Washington, D.C. People are beginning to realize that um, the CFR and the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral is not just a social club uh, for people to get together uh, once a year or however to play golf, uh, that these people really are the movers and shakers of, of governments around the world. And so much of what is decided about uh, what's going to happen internationally is determined not by the legislative or even executive bodies of government, but in these uh, international cabals known as uh, uh, the CFR and the, all these related organizations that are really probably the ones that are most influential in determining uh, international affairs. I think the Tea Party started out uh, admirably. What most people don't want, to, <laughs> don't want to admit is that the Tea Parties actually began in 2007 as a, uh, a part of Congressman Ron Paul's uh, bid for the presidency in the 2008 election. Uh, it, was, it was at that time pretty much exclusively a Ron Paul 
for president uh, organization, or at least an organization affiliated with his campaign. It was grassroots then, of course, it's still grassroots now, but I, I think over the years, since the, since the election in 2008, I think the Tea Party movement, because it has shown uh, a great deal of success and, and influence in the, the political process, I think that many within the neocon uh, uh, population of the Republican Party see the Tea Party as uh, antithetical to their agenda and therefore rather than uh, try and oppose it uh, openly as maybe the Democrats are doing, they're trying to take it over internally and refocus the energy and the philosophy of the Tea Party movement. And so I think right now, the Tea Party movement is really uh, maybe two movements in one. It's, it's the Ron Paul revolutionaries, the, the pro-Constitution, they're not enamored with either major party, uh, they don't go in for this left-right or Republican-Democrat uh, paradigm as you talked about. They are independent, they, they believe in the Constitution, limited government, uh, you know, everything that, that you know, I talk about. Uh, then you've got, I think, uh, the infiltration of the Newt Gingrich uh, side of the aisle, uh, men that are basically uh, liberals in conservative clothing uh, that are trying to hijack uh, the party. And, and I think that it's yet to be seen exactly which way the Tea Party is going to go. Uh, I, I'm excited about what they've done, and I'm excited about some of the things that, that they appear to be doing. Uh, but again, between now and 2012, it's going to be seen as to what exactly uh, becomes of the Tea Parties. I've spoken at Tea Party groups all over the country, large and small, and most of the people I've met are just really great people, and they they got their you know they got their priorities right and so forth. But again, I'm a little concerned about uh, the uh, the neocon Newt Gingrich. Uh, part of the, uh, of the movement, uh, if they continue to, to get more and more influential within the Tea Party movement, then as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the push and, and, and the movement toward constitutional government, limited government, et cetera, et cetera, is going to be DOA uh, in 2012. If the Tea Party movement will retain its integrity, if they will stick to its principles, and they will continue to uh, uncompromisingly promote the Constitution, limited government, uh, the Bill of Rights, all the things that we, that we have heard about in association with the Tea Party movement. If they'll continue to do that, I think they could be extremely influential, uh, both in 2010 in the fall elections and more importantly in 2012 uh, as the momentum will continue to grow. If, however, they begin to compromise their convictions and they begin to abandon their principles, and they begin to follow the Pied Pipers of the neocon agenda like Newt Gingrich, then uh, they will be neutered to the point that their effectiveness will be all but destroyed. And by 2012, they will be a non-issue. As, as Barry Goldwater said in 68, there isn't a dime's worth of difference between the GOP and the Democrats. Uh, and as Pat Buchanan said, they're two wings of the same bird of prey. Uh, they, they, they're both walking in the, in the same direction. That's why it doesn't matter if you elect Bill Clinton or George W. Bush. Nothing changes. It doesn't matter whether you have the Republicans in charge of the Congress or the Democrats. Very little changes. It's the same overall direction. Uh, it, more and more government, more and more internationalism. Uh, the UN is, is augmented and strengthened. The states and, and individual rights continue to be trampled. We see this burgeoning police state, the, the, the Patriot Act, and all the related uh, agencies and, and so forth that come as a result of that have, have, have happened under both the, the Republican and Democrat administrations and Congresses. So, again, at the national level, I think it goes back to maybe what you're talking about with some of these other more influential groups that seem to be much more uh, effective in exerting their will upon Washington politics, regardless of which party is in power. And until the American people, I think, wake up and, and throw away this, uh, this ridiculous uh, 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 two-party uh, partisanship and, and, and just get into the, the issues of right and wrong and, 
and the Constitution and limited government and the principles upon which America was built. Until we do that, we're not going to have any, any lasting solution. Whenever America decided that they would accept the Federal Reserve system, and whenever they, they decided that they would allow a, a, a private cartel of international bankers control uh, the, the economic uh, wherewithal of, of the United States and through the implementation of the Federal Reserve Act and the direct income tax, and, and I would even add to that the, uh, the way they expunged the principles of the 17th Amendment, I think all that goes together. The net result was America left sound money principles that had guided it from its very inception. The founders were absolutely crystal clear that America must retain uh, its, its uh, uh, sound money principles, uh, gold and silver backed currency uh, in exchange. This fiat money supply, th th this, this Federal Reserve dominated uh, money system that we have today is responsible for virtually every economic downturn and every recessionary period, including the Great Depression and the recession that we are now in today. Uh, it is a direct result of the manipulation of the American uh, money supply and, and the economy and economic ventures by uh, this cabal of international bankers who, as the people suffer in tough economic times, they continue to increase their own wealth and their own power exponentially. And so once again, this is where I would really re agree with Ron Paul, you know, it, it's not enough that we audit the Fed. We've got to eliminate the Fed. We've got to get rid of the Federal Reserve. And we've got to bring America back to sound money principles. And again, this is where the states can, can rise to the occasion. The states have the power and the authority to, to, in their own states, uh, have sound money principles established within the borders of their states. And, and I think, ultimately, that's what they're going to have to do. But the encouraging thing is the Federal Reserve, for instance, is a national issue for probably the first time in history, and people are learning about it. Correct. This. And I think that's because of Ron Paul's campaign in 2008. Uh, I believe that he was the one that articulated that issue when nobody else was willing to talk about it. and even though he lost the election, his ideas prevailed. And since 2008, what's happened to the economy? What's happened to our money supply? What's happened to uh, the overall economic well-being of our country? Everything that Ron Paul said in 2008 has come to pass in the, in the next two years. And so now the American people are looking back at the message that Ron Paul delivered in 2008, and they're saying, you know, he was right. And everybody else on the platform was wrong. And that's why I think we have uh, people today that are for the first time, as you, as you noted, being willing to at least look at the idea of either auditing the Fed or, as I suggest, getting rid of the Fed altogether. You know, the Mayak report was not new. It, it was just at that time the latest. But the thing that was new in the Mayak report was for the first time, a, a police agency, in this particular case, the Missouri State Police Agency, but as you know, uh, they receive their information uh, from the fusion centers, uh, which is controlled by the Department of Homeland Security. For the first time, uh, that report identified three individuals by name and accused their followers of being uh, potential violent extremists. And those three individuals were myself, Chuck Baldwin, Ron Paul, and Bob Barr. Now, that was the thing that was unique about the Mayak report. Interestingly, they received so much opposition, not only from the citizens of Missouri, but from people all over America, that they later recanted and apologized for that, and they actually took that report down off of their internet page, and they retracted it uh, from, their, from their state agency. But of course, the damage was done, and, and I believe that this kind of activity uh, will continue. In other words, what they're trying to do is, is to demonize and marginalize those persons whose ideas they abhor. And anyone such as myself or, or Ron Paul 
who promotes the principles of federalism, constitutionalism, a limited government, et cetera, et cetera, especially when we attack uh, things like the Federal Reserve and the United Nations and, and these uh, ever-growing uh, foreign wars and, and all these things, uh, they cannot allow those ideas to become dominant within the thinking of the American people. So to try and, and thwart the message, they try to marginalize the messenger. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to, to make us appear to be radicals, extremists, etc., so that people, when they hear what we have to say, will dismiss the message as being radical and extremist. It is a blatant attempt by the federal government of, of propagandizing uh, against uh, those individuals who are promoting the message that they, uh, within the federal government uh, and other agencies, um, wish to be silenced. Oath Keepers is a, is a wonderful organization. Uh, Stuart Rhodes, I've, I, I know personally, and I know that he's a, he's a great man and is a real patriot. Um, you know, I would encourage every police officer and every military man, whether retired or active duty, uh, to become part of the Oath Keepers. It's, it's a great group. It, it's basically what they're saying is we are going to stand for the Constitution. We are not going to allow uh, anyone within the federal government uh, to circumvent the laws prescribed in the Constitution. Everyone who takes an oath of office, whether it is a military man or a law enforcement officer or a politician, they all swear an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And what Oath Keepers is saying is that we take our oath seriously, and we are going to keep our oath to the Constitution, and we're not going to allow someone else, even someone else in government, to force us to disobey our oath to the Constitution. Again, it's more of the same trying to demonize and marginalize those individuals whose ideas uh, the powers that be find repugnant. I would compare the war on terror to the war on drugs. Uh, they, they pick an adversary, uh, an external adversary, and then they rally uh, not only the government but the American people at large against this enemy. The problem is, is that by the time they're finished implementing the strategies and, and, and techniques uh, that they're going to use against the contrived enemy, uh, they wind up uh, focusing primarily, as you just noted, on the American citizenry. And that ha that's happened in the war on drugs, and it's happening in the war on terror. I mean, we would have never had the Patriot Act and, and all of this incessant eavesdropping and recording our phone calls and intercepting our emails and listening to our cell phone conversations and, and the loss, the total loss of privacy, the, uh, the abridgment of habeas corpus, the, the Fourth Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment, and so forth and so on, if it had not been for, quote, unquote, the war on terror. Uh, I remember whenever Congressman Bob Barr was telling us that whenever he was in Congress and, and you had uh, Bill Clinton in the White House, Al Gore as vice president, the Republicans had the Congress, the same exact bill, the same exact bill was introduced in the Congress at that time. But the Republicans that controlled the Congress rejected the bill, rightly so, because they recognized it to be an overreach by the federal government into the private lives of the American people. But voila, you put a Republican in the White House, and then you have the events of 9-11 and the so-called terror attacks uh, in New York City and Washington, D.C., and without hardly a protest, the same bill that was vehemently rejected by conservatives in, in Congress uh, in the in 1990s was now readily and immediately accepted by that same group uh, in Congress. And again, it just shows that uh, the, the act of terrorism uh, was a, an excuse to implement something that they had already designed to do, something that they, they had already attempted to do, and now were able to do because of the, of the so-called terror attack. Therefore, we have been enduring the abridgments of our freedoms and our liberties and our constitutional rights ever since, and the American citizenry is the victim of, of this so-called war on terror.
Could you talk about the Oklahoma City bombing and how that event was used uh, against states' rights and against uh, militia movements and patriot groups. Right. The Bill Clinton, I will remember those days, uh, Bill Clinton, Janet Reno uh, did everything they can, uh, everything they could do at that time to again demonize and marginalize quote unquote uh, citizen militia groups. Uh, the Oklahoma City bombing was the excuse that they used at that time, just as uh, the, the uh, attack in 9-11 in, in is the excuse that the George Bush administration and now the Obama administration are using uh, to continue their uh, acts of aggression against the liberties of the American people. Uh, I, I think anybody that, that has eyes to see can recognize that there's a pattern here. And no matter who's in the White House or who's in Congress, uh, the pattern really doesn't change much. It's, it, it's still, we're still marching in the same direction toward more and more government, less and less freedom. And I think we are now to the point where that uh, individual states uh, are going to have to start standing up immediately uh, for the independence and sovereignty of the people of their state, representing the sovereigns of their state, the citizens of their states, uh, or uh, this uh, Leviathan uh, is going to devour virtually all the freedoms and liberties that were bequeathed to us by our founding fathers. If they can uh, broad brush a group of people and, and tie us into someone with uh, obvious radical views, someone who does obviously have a personal agenda uh, of some sort, whatever it may be, uh, they're going to do that. I don't think there's anything new about that. Uh, trying to picture all of us uh, as, as racist or homophobic or, or whatever it, it may happen to be, uh, they will use anyone they can to accomplish that. Uh, I, I really, I think for the most part, uh, that's, that's proving to be a, 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 a futile strategy. I, I, think, I think more and more people are, are waking up to the reality that uh, you cannot, with a broad brush, uh, put everyone in a, in a, you know, in a pigeonhole and make whatever point you want to make. I think that the American people, for the most part, are thinking enough for themselves to recognize the, uh, the fallacy of that. But there's no question they would try to do that. I caution people not to become too enamored with Fox News. Uh, I, I think that it's a mistake for the American people to trust any of these major television news networks. Uh, and I've said this in my columns, I said the major difference between Fox News and CNN is that CNN uh, will defend uh, the Democrats while attacking all things Republican, and Fox News will defend uh, the Republicans while attacking all things Democrat. It, it's not really that they are uh, marching in a different direction. It's, it, it's that they just approach it from a different angle. And that's why people have got to start thinking for themselves and recognizing that the same people that, uh, that are uh, in charge of Fox News, uh, for example, are the same people that are promoting uh, Hillary Clinton uh, when she ran for the Senate, uh, financing her campaign. The same people that are whining and dining the global elite uh, they're whining and dining the intellectual elite and the political elite and the commercial elite uh, from both sides of the, of the ocean uh, are the same ones that are in charge of the cable network news stations, whichever one you might want to talk about. And so while it, it's fine to listen to people uh, objectively and if you hear that which is good uh, and you agree with it, uh, that's fine, so be it. But be careful about uh, becoming enamored with and thinking of some of these major TV news hosts as some kind of uh, uh, iconic, heroic figures, uh, Pied Pipers uh, of freedom, etc., uh, when the fact of the matter is sometimes um, they, they could actually be diluting uh, the real message of freedom and, and, and confusing uh, the real message of freedom. So I, I just caution the American people to be careful uh, about the way they uh, 
they're enamored with Fox News or any other major TV news network. Who was it that first said, follow the money? Uh, whoever said it first got it exactly right because that's what, that's what you need to always remember. When you start following the money, it doesn't matter whether it's in politics or business or the media or even in big religion. When you start following the money, you're going to find that the bulk of it is going to wind up in the same place. It's, it's the same cabal of people uh, that are pulling the strings behind most of these endeavors. And, and that's why uh, no matter whether it's a big television network, a big media outlet, or whether it's a uh, big newspaper, or whether it's a uh, big uh, uh, religion and, and me super mega churches, and, or whether it's uh, the business community or the political establishment, again, you're going to come back, if you follow the money, to the same basic group of people that are benefiting uh, from the promotion of whatever angle that they choose to promote. There's a lot of things that Glenn Beck says that I really like. And he, he said things on major, if you want to call Fox a major network news, at least it's a major cable news network, that few other people were willing to say. Uh, and so for those, for those reasons, uh, yeah, I admire some of the things he said. But on the other hand, he will turn right around and either impugn or denigrate true champions of constitutional government, such as Ron Paul, and will also promote the candidacies of big government neocons. I think, I think one of the biggest examples of that in, in relation to Fox News in general is the way they promote Newt Gingrich. Uh, Newt Gingrich is a, he is a fox, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He will say anything he needs to say to fool conservatives into supporting him. When he was Speaker of the House and the contract with America took place back in 1994 elections and the Republicans took over both the House and Senate, first time in what, over 40 years at that time, promising to eliminate five federal departments to reduce slash the overall spending and size and scope of the federal government, et cetera, et cetera. What happened after the, after the Republicans took both houses? It was Newt Gingrich and Trent Lott who deliberately uh, reneged on their promises and actually led uh, the Republicans or, and, and tried to influence and, and coerce the Republicans, including the freshmen who had just been elected in 94, into doing the opposite of what they had campaigned for and promoting more taxes, bigger government. And look at what happened. By the time 1995 came and went, all of the promises of the 94 campaign were history. All of the, all of the agencies, not only the federal agencies, not only were they funded equally, they, they increased their funding. And the government, the federal government in D.C. grew in size, shape, and scope under Newt Gingrich, as Speaker of the House, uh, in 1995 and beyond, uh, as it had been doing before the Contract of America was ever invented. Newt Gingrich, if he is allowed to become influential, if he, if he God forbid, becomes the Republican standard bearer in, in 2010, uh, you can kiss any form of, of uh, constitutional renewal, constitutional revival, you can kiss it goodbye. He will absolutely destroy, he'll destroy the Tea Party movement, he'll destroy uh, the conservative movement, whatever is left in the Republican Party, uh, and yet look at the way Fox promotes Newt Gingrich. Uh, that's just one example. I, I think that uh, it, it, they, it's almost like they're playing uh, both you know, both sides of the street at the same time. Uh, Glenn Beck, I, I thought, was probably the one that may have doomed the candidacy of Deborah Medina in Texas with, uh, in my opinion, uh, kind of a hatchet job 
on his show uh, relative to her candidacy. And supported uh, Rick Perry, who's running with the Bilderberg Group and been a slave of, of the system and used to be a Democrat. And, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you. but hey, No, exactly right. That's what I was going to say. So again, on the one hand, you hear him saying some truly wonderful things. On the other hand, you see him doing some very, very uh, harmful things. Uh, so I, I, again, I have mixed emotions. Another thing that kind of gives me mixed uh, or gives me pause about Glenn Beck is, you know, when we were running as an independent Constitution Party candidate uh, in 2008, my staff tried to get me on every single one of the major cable and network news programs, including Glenn Beck. Uh, and they would not have us on. The only uh, television uh, talk show host uh, that would have me on was Lou Dobbs on CNN. And look what happened to Lou Dobbs after, after the election. Uh, Glenn Beck would not have me on. Uh, none of the other hosts on Fox would have me on. We tried to get on. You know, where, where was the, the message? Who was giving the message of constitutional government in 2008? After Ron Paul was defeated in the primary, who was bringing the message? If Glenn Beck really wanted to promote the message of constitutional government, limited government, principles of freedom, the Bill of Rights, the message of the Founding Fathers, uh, John McCain wasn't, wasn't preaching that message. Uh, Barack Obama wasn't preaching that message. But Chuck Baldwin in the general election was preaching that message. And yet, we never had the opportunity one time to deliver that message to Glenn Beck's audience. They have reached a point uh, in the evolution of all, of all of this globalism that they really are not trying to hide it all that much anymore. It's almost an in-your-face, you know, here we are, what are you going to do about it kind of attitude. And I, I think that, uh, personally, uh, the Clintons uh, and the Bush families are uh, involved in, in many dubious uh, and sinister activities. Uh, don't be surprised if Hillary Clinton becomes vice president before the 2012 uh, re-election campaign of, of Barack Obama. I think uh, the globalists uh, and the syndicate uh, of uh, uh, those internationalists that are, that are working toward the uh, unification of, of, of the economies of the world, etc., uh, I think they feel they need her in the White House. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if she becomes vice president before uh, the 2012 election. It also will not surprise me if Barack Obama wins re-election. Don't think for one minute uh, that uh, uh, Obama, Mr. Obama is out of the uh, election uh, victory road uh, here, in, you know, because of all these polls and so forth that we're seeing in 2010. Um, you got to remember that the, the, the powers that we're talking about still control uh, the news media for the most part. And they still have the opportunity to, uh, to turn uh, elections one way or the other. And as, especially if the Republicans put up a neocon, I, I mean an obvious, blatant neocon, somebody like a Newt Gingrich, someone of that nature, who real conservatives just could not even think about supporting. Uh, and that, if that were the case, then Mr. Obama gets four more years. And if Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton is his vice president, it puts another Clinton uh, in the White House. And again, the Clinton-Bush cabal, uh, in, in, in my opinion, is, is part of a very dubious, sinister uh, organization uh, that is working against the interests of freedom and liberty in this country. The difference between the Republicans and the Democrats now at the national level is that the Democrats want to tax and spend to promote the welfare state. The Republicans want to borrow and spend to promote the warfare state. But neither party in Washington, D.C. wants to live by the Constitution, wants to put the federal government under the constraints and the chains of the Constitution. Neither party in Washington, D.C. wants to do that. And the GOP, uh, under George W. Bush, has become 
uh, a, a an empire building, uh, nation building, warmongering party. Uh, I, I think it has betrayed the fundamental precepts of what many of the uh, old time Republicans uh, actually believed and stood for. Uh, I, mean, I think Ron Paul's message during the, the primary elections of 2008 was was spot on. Uh, it, it's only it, it was is only after uh, Mr. Bush redefined uh, conservatism that now in the in the minds of, of many Republicans and people that call themselves conservatives, including my brothers in the clergy and and Christians in in the churches, have come to look at at uh, uh, undeclared, uh, unprovoked foreign wars as some kind of a holy cause. Uh, we, have, we have lost all sense of, of the just war theory and why we go to war and what are the right reasons for war and how do you, how do you go to war and so forth. All the things that historically Americans believed uh, have now been repudiated by the George W. Bush brand of Republicanism uh, to the point now that uh, it, it, what we see today as conservatism, or as, it's, as it's known, uh, is not even remotely related to what conservatism was uh, back before George W. Bush became president. I believe we need a revolution of states. I, I, I go back to the principles of federalism that were incorporated into our, our Constitution that has made America what it is. That was the great experiment of 1787. The experiment was you would have two governments, two nation states, if you please, uh, living side by side, each respecting the constraints and the jurisdiction of the other. Yeah, the federal government respecting the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, accepting uh, the definitions of its role under the Constitution, the states recognizing their authority under the Constitution, and the rights of their citizens under the Bill of Rights, understanding the Tenth Amendment gave them much greater power and latitude than the federal government ever, ever could have and the states respecting uh, the federal government in the role that it was given them, the federal government respecting the states in the role that was given to them, living side by side, harmoniously, peacefully. That was the great experiment of the U.S. Constitution. What's happened is the federal government has grown in power uh, to the point that it is swallowing up uh, the states and it is, it is uh, causing uh, the principles of federalism to be destroyed. The revolution we need is a revolution of state governments backed by uh, the governors, the legislators, uh, the attorneys general, uh, the courts of the states, and of course ultimately by we the people, the sovereigns of that state, uh, uh, we, with their own will and yes with their own arms that are willing to defend the principles of constitutionalism and federalism uh, as prescribed uh, in, in those great founding documents. And, and, and so that's why I say if the only thing we have in 2010 and 2012 is another quote conservative movement, all it's going to do is fuel the same system. The same system that is destroying us is going to continue to grow and there'll be no change. And so what we need is a revolutionary uh, idea uh, similar to what happened in 75 and 76 when, when the founders said we are not going to be ruled by one central state. We are going to incorporate a, a system of law and governance whereby the people will govern themselves under law. And here is the law. And they established this federalist system, a confederation of nation states whereby each state is free and independent and able to protect the rights and, and, and sanctity of its own borders and its own citizenry. And until we get people in the, in the, in the states to recognize that responsibility and that duty and in a revolutionary manner stand up for those rights and those duties, 
all we're going to do is to continue to fuel the same beast, the same system that is swallowing up uh, the liberties and the freedoms of the American people. It's really not a left-right battle. It's not a conservative-liberal battle. It really is, it's, it's a constitution battle. Uh, it is a, an independence battle. It is a, is it a battle for uh, the independence of our states, the, the, the sovereignty of our states, the sovereignty of our country, the rights and liberties of our, of our citizenry against uh, a burgeoning new world order, an order of globalism of international scale, uh, a cabal of people that really do despise our form of government and really do want to eradicate the principles of freedom upon which it was established. This is not a battle between left and right or between conservative and liberal. Uh, I, I had, in my campaign in 2008, I could not tell you how many people that would identify themselves as moderates or even l leaning to the left that supported me uh, enthusiastically. Now, they may not have agreed with everything that I believed on the social issues, but they understood my commitment to freedom and liberty and constitutional government, federalism, etc. And, and at the end of the day, it, it, that is going to be the issue that is either going to, to revive freedom in this country or bury freedom in this country, depending on, on how we respond to this battle. So, no, I agree with you. It's, it, and that's why I don't worry about people that identify themselves in one way or the other uh, politically. Uh, we talk about the Constitution, freedom, liberty, the Bill of Rights, federalism, et cetera, and, and it's amazing how many people, especially young people today, that, uh, that resonate with that message. My family and I, which includes uh, 17 people and five families, have decided to, after 35 years living here in Pensacola, Florida, my wife and I started this church from scratch 35 years ago. Uh, we've poured our hearts and soul into this, into this ministry. Um, we have friends of a lifetime here. Uh, this is an excruciating, uh, gut-wrenching decision. But we made the decision uh, a few weeks ago that we were going to move lock, stock, and barrel, all of us, to the northwestern part, uh, the uh, Flathead Valley of Montana. Uh, why in the world would anybody leave the, the sunny south and the beaches of the Gulf Coast for uh, the cold and snow of the, of the Rocky Mountains? Uh, we really believe, as I've been talking about in this interview, the importance of states uh, standing up for uh, the freedoms and liberties uh, that have been uh, guaranteed to us in the Constitution. In my travel, over, over 60,000 miles in the last two years, from coast to coast and border to border, I've seen just about every part of this country that there is to see, and I've seen the states in which freedom is pretty much non-existent. And I've seen the, the states where there is a love of liberty still burning brightly in the hearts of, of the people. And I found that most in the mountain states. Uh, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, uh, the Dakotas, Utah, uh, even across the border in Alberta and British Columbia, Alaska, I, I found that there was still a, a really a, a group of people that loved liberty, understood the principles of liberty, and were willing to fight for it. And I really believe, and my family all agree with me, that uh, if there is any hope for a revival and a restoration of liberty in this country, it's only going to come in and through those states that are willing to stand and fight for those liberties. And quite frankly, I don't see a lot of states that are willing to do that. But I do feel that many of those mountain states, including Montana, uh, still have it in their heart uh, to fight for those principles. And so we're going there. We're not going there to vacation. We're not going there to bask in, in the sun or ski or hide or hibernate. We are going there to fight. We're going there to work. We're going there to stand shoulder to shoulder with freedom-loving people and whatever talents and abilities and gifts 
and voice that we can bring uh, to that to that part of the world, uh, we just want to lend our assistance to those people and spend the rest of our lives fighting for the liberty uh, that God has given to us. And so here in just a few weeks, uh, we're going to be gone and uh, we are going to find a new home and who knows? Who knows? Uh, in the 1880s, Montana experienced a gold rush. And I'm thinking in the 2010s, uh, Montana might experience a freedom rush. And we want to be part of that rush. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want. Mm -hmm.